I'm going to talk you through a VB.NET implementation of the A star algorithm, specifically for this graph. Let's make sure we understand what it is we're working with. This graph consists of several interconnected nodes, or vertices. Each vertex has a payload, which is simply a letter. In my example, they represent locations in a secret magical maze for a computer game. But they could just as well represent towns and cities on a map, distribution stations in a power grid, friends in a social network, neurons in a brain simulation, or protein molecules in a complex chemical reaction. You name it. The edge between each vertex has a weight or cost. These are also shown on the graph. In my example, they represent the distances between the locations. Each vertex on this graph also has grid coordinates, which you can see here on the magical maze. For example, vertex D has coordinates 412. These grid coordinates will be used to estimate the distance from each vertex to the destination. The so-called heuristics, or H values, that A star depends so much upon. This program will use an adjacency matrix to store details of the edges. Because this will be a zero-based, two-dimensional array, each vertex is represented on the adjacency matrix by a number. Notice that the adjacency matrix has a line of symmetry across the diagonal, which is what you'd expect from an undirected graph. You can move backwards or forwards on any edge of this graph. Ultimately, this is what the program will generate. A list of previous vertices that contains the information we're looking for. The shortest path from A to P, or at least one of them. In fact, our program will be written to find the shortest path from any vertex to any other vertex in the graph. Here's the pseudocode. Let's take a look at how this translates into a VB.NET implementation. This code makes use of the same vertex and graph classes as my implementation of Dijkstra's algorithm with a few extra properties in the vertex class specifically for use by the A star program. We have a value, which is the payload of the vertex. We have an index number, which serves as an identifier for use in the adjacency matrix. We have X and Y grid coordinates. These are used to calculate the heuristics. And you can see as well that each vertex maintains its own G value, its own F value, and its own parent. I've written a method as a function which returns the h value for each vertex. It's passed a destination as a vertex and it uses this along with the grid coordinates to calculate the h value. I'm calculating the Euclidean distance here, which is the straight line distance between two vertices. But I could have used the Manhattan distance instead. We'll see this code in action a little bit later. The constructor of the vertex class is passed an index number, a value, which is the payload, and the x and y grid coordinates. Here's the graph class. This is a partially object-oriented approach. I have a vertex class and a graph class, and the graph class maintains an array of vertex objects. But the graph class also makes use of the adjacency matrix to represent the edges, and this is a two-dimensional array of integers. So the adjacency matrix refers to each vertex by its index number. This is why I've given each vertex an index number property to serve as an identifier that corresponds to the index number in the matrix. I'm sure I could have come up with a purely OO implementation in which my adjacency matrix was a 2D array of vertex objects, or a purely procedural approach with no classes at all. But I think this hybrid approach is quite efficient in terms of memory usage and it's afforded some simplicity by using objects. It lets me focus on the A-star pathfinding algorithm, which, after all, 
is always going to require a problem-specific approach. When the graph object is first created, it initialises the adjacency matrix so that all of the edges are zero. Here's the add vertex method of the graph. It puts each new vertex into an array of vertices. And here's the add edge method of my graph. This has been written for undirected graphs, so two corresponding edges are added at the same time. Here in the form code, I'm adding the vertices and the edges. It's all hard-coded for a particular graph, but if I was writing a game with multiple levels, each with a different graph, I'd probably invest some time in making a better way to do this. Perhaps I could read the data from a file, or have a form that lets me drag and drop vertices and edges into their correct positions quickly. And here's my A-star pathfinding code. It's been written as a method of the graph class. You can see it's passed the start and destination vertices as parameters. In fact, these are the ID numbers of the start and destination. And it returns a list of strings. This is the path information we're looking for. I have my lists of open and closed vertices. I could have used array variables, but vb.net's list object is actually rather convenient for my purposes. I also have a list of unvisited vertices. I'm going to use this vertex object to keep track of the current vertex. I start by putting all of the graph's vertices into the list of unvisited vertices. Then I take the start vertex and I make it current by copying it to current vertex. The start vertex is a special case, so it's handled outside of the main loop. I calculate its G and F values. In fact, I set the G value property to zero, of course, because the distance from start to start is zero. I set the F value property by adding the G value to the H value. To get the start vertex's H value, I call its H method, which is past the destination vertex. Then comes the main loop. This loop will run while the current vertex is not the destination vertex. I need to work with the potential successors of the current vertex, so I'm scanning all of the vertices in the graph but testing to see which ones share an edge with the current vertex. Notice that this loop is using a counter variable i, rather than scanning the vertex objects with a for each loop. I did this because the adjacency matrix is an array of integers. There's probably dozens of ways I could have approached this, but I think this is quite intuitive. So, for each neighbour, I check to see if the neighbour is not open and is not closed. I add it to the list of open vertices. You can see I'm removing it from the list of unvisited vertices as well. And I set its parent to be the current vertex. This test ensures that all of the neighbours are open, but it may well be that some neighbours are already open. So what happens from now on happens unconditionally for all open neighbours of the current vertex. I'm calculating the G, H and F values of the neighbour that I'm currently working with to see if it's a potential successor to the current vertex. I update the G and F values and the parent if the new F value is smaller than any existing one or if the existing one is zero which means that it's a brand new F value. And when we drop out of the for loop because we've checked all of the neighbours of the current vertex I can close the current vertex and then set about reassigning it. The new current vertex will be the one with the smallest f value. I've set a variable called smallest f to an impossibly large value. Then I scan the list of open vertices and replace this variable with anything smaller that I come across. 
When I drop out of this loop, I next current gives me the one with the smallest f value. Finally, here I'm establishing the new current vertex. And around the main loop we go again. Once we're out of the main loop, I just need to collect up the path information. The idea is that the parent of each vertex is the one that precedes it on the path. So I could do this. I get the value of the parent of the destination. Then I get the value of the parent of the parent of the destination, and so on. But of course, I don't know how many steps there were in the path, so I need to generate this information in a loop. I have a list of strings to hold the payloads of each vertex. Then I'm using a loop to visit each vertex's predecessor. I'm taking a more object-oriented approach this time. I'll end up with a path in reverse order, but there's a nifty little method of the list object which I can use. I can simply call the reverse method of that list. Finally, just for good measure, I'm getting the g value of the current vertex, which is the length of the path. And then I can return it to the caller. To make this work, I have to create the graph first. I have a button on the form that does this. We've already seen it. I have another button on the form which calls the A star method of the graph class. And you can see I'm passing it the start and the destination nodes. My path information comes back as a list of strings, so I have a little loop here which is scanning that list and creating an output string which I can use in a message box. Here we go. I'll create the graph. And there's the shortest path from A to P, with a distance of 28. That looks about right. Now let's give it a try with the other heuristic. Here I calculated the Euclidean distance between each vertex and the destination. Let's try it with the Manhattan distance. I'll create the graph, ask for the shortest path, and I'm getting something different this time. But it is the shortest path. My graph has got two possible shortest routes to get to the destination. So this is working. Now one final test. I'm going to change the graph. I'm going to increase the distance from A to C. Let's make that 15. I need to change it here as well, remember, because it's an undirected graph. We can move in either direction. I'm also going to increase the distance from B to D. Let's make that 33. So the idea is I'm going to force the path to go via B. Let's make sure it works. Build the graph, and there's my new shortest path. And again, that looks like it's working fine. 